unplug the machine and keep the plug visible. To remove these metal skirts, undo four screws at the front, four screws at the back, and then the skirt will slide off. Number two Phillips screwdriver works good. You may need to loosen these four screws on the end. It may not be necessary to remove the skirts in order to change the cutter head, but I was having trouble moving the in-feed and out-feed table up and down, and I think it's because there's so much sawdust buildup in the joints. With the dust cleared out, I can see the pivot joints and a rack and pinion gear in there. So I'll lubricate that with a dry Teflon lubricant and see how it runs. So that moves quite smoothly now. Remove the belt cover with this single screw. Remove the belt by rolling it off. Undo this nut with a 19 millimeter hex wrench while a piece of wood is jammed into the cutter head to stop the shaft from rotating. Pulley comes off easily. Take out the spline so it doesn't get lost. Remove these four bolts with a 10 millimeter hex wrench. Release this reverse thread nut with a board jammed into the cutter head. It's a left hand thread. Then slide this piece out. Remove the key so it doesn't get lost. With the bolts removed from the front, I can now tap out the bearing from the back. And I've made a tool from a piece of ABS pipe, four and a half inches long, and sanded down at the end to get an outside diameter of 46 millimeter, which fits the outer part of the bearing. And that's where you want to apply the pressure because if you applied the pressure to the shaft, you could damage the bearing. And we want to push the bearing out of the casting. It's a one-time use tool. I don't know if you can see there, the bearing has moved. It should get easier as we go. Now I'm getting stuck in the hole because of the taper. So I'm going to sand some more off. And I think we're through. So from the other side, whole cutter head right out. Remove the blade cover, the blade spring, and the blade that gives access to these screws that hold the bearing in. A screwdriver with a wrench is a good idea so that it can be close to the cutter head, not hitting the screw on too much an angle. Then you can push down with one hand and turn with the wrench so you don't strip the screw head. There's a special cup washer there. Don't want to lose that. The bearing is now free to be knocked out of the casting and I've just selected a socket head that fits in there. By doing a little grinding with the Dremel tool around here, I've knocked off the high points and that gives me another 50 thousandths of an inch clearance. Probably did much more than I needed to, but it gives me a good comfort factor that the blades won't be too close to the casting. The bearing can be hammered onto the shaft of the cutter head, but bearing manufacturers recommend that the inner part of the bearing be heated up so that it expands and then you don't have to use as much force putting it onto the cutter head and therefore you don't have the risk of deforming the bearing or the shaft. The manufacturer recommends 100 degrees centigrade maximum working temperature and 120 degrees maximum for short periods of time. An easy way to heat up a bearing in the center is place it on top of an incandescent light bulb and now the question is how long should you leave it there? So I've got a thermocouple meter thermocouple touching the inside of the bearing held in place by a clothespin and a stopwatch timer. Turn on the 40 watt incandescent bulb and start the timer at the same time. So that took 19 minutes to get up to 100 degrees centigrade which is about where I'd probably want to stop and of course you won't need the thermometer meter because you just put it on for 19 or 20 minutes and rest your bearing on top. You don't need all this clothespin and wire stuff. Okay, we're back to 26 degrees. I've got a 60 watt light bulb. Turn that on, start the timer, and we'll see how long it takes to get to 100 degrees centigrade. So with the 60 watt bulb, we hit 100 degrees centigrade in 10 minutes.
Okay, repeating with a 100 watt bulb. Okay, that took four minutes to get to 100 degrees C. So there's four and a half minutes to get to 106 degrees. 110 degrees takes five minutes. From the and 115 degrees took five and a half minutes. And 120 degrees takes six minutes and 10 seconds. So that's, we're now at the maximum even short term bearing temperature. So I did that to give an idea of um, what's the difference between rising up to 100 degrees, which I think was four minutes versus 126 minutes. Gives you an idea of how accurately you're gonna have to time the thing. The Shell X head arrived, and the first thing I noticed is that one of the knives is crooked. So I contacted Bird, and they assured me that that is not a defect, it's by design, and that's in order that the head can cut a clean rabbit. I'm going to remove that one cutter head because it'll be in the way when I'm installing the bearing. I drilled a one and three quarter inch hole in a scrap of wood and I'm setting that over a hole in my bench so that I can drop the head in there and there you can see why I removed that knife because it would have been digging into the wood. If you don't have a hole in the bench you just need a thicker piece of wood here to take the length of the shaft. I'll heat this bearing on a 100 watt incandescent bulb for four minutes, then place it on the shaft and drive it on with this plumbing fitting that fits just right to apply the force to the inner ring of the bearing so that I don't distort the bearing. And I've cleaned the inside of the bearing carefully as well as the shaft so there's no grit and I just wiped with my fingers some light oil on the shaft. Hey Siri, set a timer for four minutes. Your timer is set for four minutes. Okay, that should bring us up to 100 degrees C. I got a glove so I don't burn my hand. We'll see how this works. Looks to be going on good and straight. and I'm fully seated. The bearing for the other end of the shaft cannot be applied directly to the shaft because it has to fit into the casting and then be retained with this thing and you wouldn't be able to put the screws in if you had already put the bearing on the casting. I'm hanging off the edge of the bench so that this can rest firmly on the bench and then I want to drive the bearing in with the pressure on the outside edge which doesn't take much force at all. The bolts that came with the machine were in really tight and when I removed them the heads got stripped. So I bought some new bolts and these are a um, very good quality grade 10.9 steel which I actually just picked up at the local hardware store. And I'm going to put them on with a little bit of uh, blue Loctite which is removable. I never want these screws to work loose because if they do the only way to tighten them would be to remove the whole head from the bearing. And there's a cup lock washer under each screw that came with the jointer. These are M5 by 16 millimeter and they tighten up with a 3 millimeter hex wrench. And with the Loctite I won't need to go crazy tight to stop them from working loose. I'll just do a nice tightness. There's the casting with the bearing bolted inside resting on the light bulb. Hey Siri, set a timer for four minutes. Okay, four minutes and counting. Okay, that's four minutes. I've got paper wrapped around the cutter head so that I don't chip any of the cutters on the way in. I've cleaned the bearing outer surface and the hole in the casting that the bearing is going to go into. And I'm holding the shaft from the other end to line everything up. Okay, we're not all the way in, but we're in far enough that it's registered so I think I can remove the paper. And I'm going to put a washer and a nut on here so that I can tap on the shaft to take it the rest of the way home. Uh, this was a left hand thread. It's now a right hand thread. 
and that's going in without much force at all. Force. Four screws with a 10 millimeter wrench. Okay, we can put back the outside knives that we removed and make sure the surfaces are free of any debris. Don't push the knife up against the shoulder, push it away from the shoulder and let the screw pull it in. I have a torque wrench so I can set it to the torque recommended by Bird. And there you can see the knife that would cut rabbits which they purposely put on a different angle so that you get a clean rabbit cut over the edge. The short spline goes in here with the rounded edge as shown. As this is now a right hand thread rather than a left hand thread I'll put a little Loctite on it so that it doesn't work loose. When I hold a straight edge across the two pulleys I can see that this top one is about 12 thousandths of an inch uh, in too far. So I'll make a shim to put behind that pulley. I clamped a piece of brass shim stock 12 one thousandths of an inch thick between these two pieces of wood. I uh, drilled the hole to get out the center. So that gave us a pretty clean hole. And now I'll just trim around the edge to make a circle. Here's the beautiful washer. Perfect alignment of the pulleys so there'll be no extra stress on the belt. For some reason I had to grind down this key quite a bit to make it fit. Washer and M12 metric nut. Jam a board into the cutter head, roll the belt on. And the belt cover hooks in, long bolt. Number two Phillips screwdriver. We want the outfeed table to be parallel to the cutting edge. Get the table clean, flat piece of wood, and you can see when I rotate here I get maybe an almost an eighth of an inch. And it's not the same on every knife. Some of them just skim. But when I come down here, I get a little brushing sound but never any movement. So I'm thinking this end has to come up a very small amount. The easiest way to raise this end slightly is undo these bolts, one on each side, and then put a thin shim between the base and the casting. Okay, I've got this propped up with a credit card, and I'm starting with a one one thousandths of an inch thick shims, one on each side. I'll pull out the credit card so the shims are trapped in there. And I, I didn't try and drill a hole in that thin shim stock, that would be too hard. So I'm just going to try and puncture a hole. I would say they're all about the same. Something I want to show is that the outer cutting edge here is slightly beyond the edge of the table and that allows a proper rabbit cut to be made. And that didn't happen with the original Makita straight blades because they were only 8 inches long whereas this cutting distance is 8.1 inches. So this is an improvement and there is still plenty of clearance to the casting. I think 0.1 inches it looks like at least. Clean up the tables with a green 3M scotch Bright pad. Wipe that off and then I'll spray with table saw, Teflon, dry lubricant.
And I'll do the same thing with the fence before I put it back on. I got a snarly piece of hard white maple, lots of knots and twisting grain. And I'm going to take off 0 0.02 inches, 20 thousandths of an inch. And we'll see if there's any tear and how the motor is able to uh, deal with the new cutter head. So there you can see the quality of the finish. Very little tear out, and that's around a very difficult grain area. So that's much better than I would ever get with the uh, Makita straight blades. I've adjusted it for a 0 0.01 inch cut, 10 thousandths of an inch, and that's actually where I would normally have left the jointer on with the old Makita blades. So that's even a little better on the uh, the really tough spot there. With the old straight blades, I would not have even tried to use a piece of wood like this because I'd get so much tear out that I would want to have to sand off a sixteenth of an inch of wood.